Today on Geology Talk, our geology news, a recap of the Honga Tonga eruption, notes from the Quartzfield field trip, and Oregon yellowcake uranium mining. Welcome to Geology Talk, our monthly gathering of geology enthusiasts brought to you by the Geological Society of the Oregon Country with support from the Portland State Department of Geology and the Beverly Vogt Scholarship Fund. Our panelists today, Andrew Dunning, Clark Neuendorf, Kerry Gordon, and myself, Paul Edison Lam, and I will just hand it off to Andrew for the Geology News. Thanks, Paul. So I was originally going to go through and you know, list off some of my favorite research pieces from the year. There's been some really cool stuff coming out, but um, as I was doing that, everything kept coming back to the Hunga Tonga eruption from the South Pacific in January. Uh, when I was at the Seismological Society convention in uh, April, half the convention floor was just about research from that. Um, and, you know, every month, every journal has something about it. It really, truly was the most important volcanic eruption that has been captured on modern instruments. Um, so it ended up monopolizing my year in review news, but I'll start with some December pertinent material. Let me get that pulled up. Here is my year in review for 2022. It's been a good year for geology and other things. I'm gonna start with the uh, December events. Biggest earthquake of the month was a magnitude 6.8 offshore of Samoa. That's this guy right here. Northern end of the Tonga Trench, which extends all the way south to the northern end of New Zealand. Tsunami watch issued. Nothing was um, recorded uh, in terms of tsunamis locally or distally. There were a few aftershocks of previous earthquakes from earlier in the year in Mexico right here and Alaska out here in the Aleutians. They were uh, magnitude 6.0 events. There was a magnitude 5.2 earthquake in central Texas, uh, which was related to oil and gas drilling. And this magnitude 6.4 offshore of Ferndale, California. Uh, this earthquake is a strike slip lateral motion. This happened actually just this last week. Um, so this is a strike slip lateral motion earthquake uh, right here next to the Mendocino Triple Junction. Uh, it occurred at 17.9 kilometers below the surface. So it was actually located in the subducting Gorda Plate. So this chunk here is the Gorda Plate, which is the southernmost segment of the Juan de Fuca Plate, which is diving underneath North America, underneath our feet as we speak. <clears throat> And because this earthquake happened uh, in that actual subducted underground part of the Gorda Plate, um, there's no evidence that any of this surface rupture reached the surface. So we don't have any uh, faulting on the surface. There were two fatalities, which were cardiac related uh, in some quite elderly people and 17 injuries as a result of the shaking. This was quite a violent earthquake. Um, 15,000 homes were damaged, 60,000 without power for a few days, and it was the largest earthquake in the United States since 2020. Uh, this is the same area as right here, a magnitude 6.2 earthquake occurred in December last year, almost exactly a year before. Um, in this map, you can see these are all aftershocks of the main earthquake, which was centered right under here, where the densest uh, smattering of aftershocks are. And this shows us that the fault was striking or oriented roughly this direction. So we got kind of a east northeast orientation here. Uh, the earthquake was centered offshore, but then propagated underneath uh, continental North America. There's quite a bit of local damage from this. This is a historic creamery. We've got uh, fireplace chimneys were toppled. Uh, some notable damage to the primary bridge over the Eel River in the area and uh, some pretty dramatic home damage as well. Moving on to volcanoes, it has a, an eventful month for global volcanoes. There's currently 42 ongoing or new eruptions, which is within normal parameters, with substantial activity at Songhai in Ecuador, a 20,000 foot tall ash plume, so that's a quite substantial eruption uh, explosion. At uh, Santiago Ito in Guatemala, right over here, there was some dome growth, so lava getting slowly extruded from the volcano's crater, making a little pile like at Mount St. Helens. 
Lava flows were issued from Stromboli and Etna in Italy, and Mauna Loa, the world's biggest active volcano, uh, got up to some hijinks. You may remember at the end of the last uh, meetup, I said, there's no current evidence that Mauna Loa is likely to erupt imminently. Do remember uh, that, yes. Which is what the HVO said, that's what the USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory said, uh, and then 36 hours later, it erupted. <laughs> this is the first eruption of Mauna Loa since 1984, and uh, it was the first eruption since then to coincide with an eruption of Kilauea, which was maintaining an active lava lake at the time. The eruption began in uh, Mauna Loa's enormous summit caldera, and then it migrated down to these little fissures erupting off the northeast rift zone of the volcano. And these fissure style eruptions, these curtains of lava, uh, send lava flows down toward the main highway, which goes between Mauna Loa here in the foreground and Mauna Kea in the background. So it's the main highway that crosses uh, the island of Hawaii. And it did cease on December 13th. Quite Quite the dramatic light show from uh, viewpoints within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, the lava lake at Kilauea, and the fissure eruptions up at Mauna Loa. This was a uh, very spectacular event. And luckily, no significant damage or anything too terrible happened as a result of it, which I love to see. Moving on to the best of the year. Uh, earthquakes, these are all of the magnitude 6.0 or greater earthquakes that happened this last year. There's quite a lot of them. Magnitude 6.7 was the largest of the year here on Papua New Guinea. It triggered many, many landslides, uh, which ended up killing 21 people and injuring 47 others, mostly as a result of those landslides. Uh, there was also a 7.6 in Mexico, which was an aftershock of a earthquake that happened Wait, no, this was not an aftershock. This is an independent, <laughs> independent event, magnitude 6.6 .6 in Mexico. This happened back in uh, August, I believe. It's a subduction zone earthquake, which actually ruptured the frictional contact between the Cocos plate and the North American plate. Uh, it uh, affected 37 people. Those are injuries, plus a six foot tsunami was uh, detected in the surrounding ocean communities. So that's a Quite a large event. Here in the US, we had 2,400 earthquakes rated in magnitude 2.5. This is pretty normal from a year to year uh, standpoint. Most of them are concentrated right here in the San Andreas fault zone and here in the Eastern California shear zone. Uh, these are combined basically the most seismically active parts of the US. Um, still aftershocks from the 2020 uh, Bora Peak, wait, yeah, Bora Peak earthquake here in central Idaho. I'm surprised those keep going on. Uh, there are also a lot of earthquakes here in the Midwest as a result of oil and gas activity, as well as some normal background seismicity for the New Madrid seismic zone. But my favorite one from this last year was this one, a magnitude 4.4 outside of Lebanon, Oregon. As far as I can tell, the largest earthquake that's happened in Oregon in uh, quite a few years. I don't think it was since the Mount Angel earthquake, but I could be wrong there. Global volcanoes, uh, there was some good activity this year. At Mount Etna, there were explosions and extensive lava flows, which have been going from May to June and November to present. These are satellite pictures showing that. Got big lava flows here going down the flanks of the volcano. Uh, Etna is the largest volcano in Europe. It's huge and it's pretty much erupting all the time. A tall volcano in the Philippines had 66 phreatomagmatic, that's steam explosions back in March and has been in a state of what the Philippine Volcanic uh, Survey calls unrest. So that's volcanoes and gas, or not volcanoes, that's earthquakes and gas emissions coming from the main crater. Uh, this is a small steam explosion for this volcano. There was a, uh, quite a major steam explosion back in 2020. In Iceland at, uh, uh, however you pronounce this in Iceland, this is a lava flow from the same, uh, well, one valley over from when the uh, Fagradasfjall eruptions uh, took place last year. But the biggest event of the year 
was Hunga Tonga in the South Pacific, which this just epic scale volcanic explosion. It was the largest volcanic eruption since Krakatoa in 1883 and the most powerful ever directly observed with modern instruments. The explosion alone sent tsunamis across the Pacific. The atmospheric shock waves caused their own tsunamis. So much energy was trapped in these atmospheric shock waves that they created one foot tall tsunamis in the Caribbean, which is an entire um, you know, ocean away. Uh, the tsunami that the explosion created from the eruption affected all of the nearby areas and sent you know, waves all across the Pacific Ocean. So I wanted to go into this step by step. What made this eruption so big, so special, so rare? So back in December 2021, after a roughly six year hiatus, uh, the Hunga Tonga volcano started erupting with some comparatively minor steam eruptions. This is what it looked like right up to that point. The 2014-15 eruption center uh, made a small volcanic cone in between these two rocks, which composed the sort of twin islands that were the visible portion of the volcano, uh, which is viewed here in cross-section. We had the large caldera block flanked with uh, occasional older deposits from eruption centers. A lot of these surface eruption deposits don't last very long because they're generally pretty soft and the ocean erodes them pretty quickly. And up to uh, December, it looked like this. This is what the volcano looked like, which is the biggest it had been for quite a while. And most of the steam eruptions it had been producing looked basically like this. Uh, it's called a Circean eruption. This is what you get when a volcano erupts underwater. This, excuse me, dark plume is made up of mostly steam and uh, the dark material is erupted rock. These are January 14th, these images. Uh, so after a few weeks of quiet and the volcano looking like this, uh, we got a resurgence of these steam eruptions with some quite large eruption plumes. Uh, if they weren't immediately overshadowed by what followed, uh, these <laughs> dramatic eruptions would have taken the cake for at least the first half of this year. So January 14th, 4 a.m. local time, an eruption cloud was detected on satellite radar. Uh, and it emerged from the island and it rose 16 to 20 kilometers and ballooned out to 260 kilometers across. There were numerous smaller tsunamis detected in the sort of one to two foot range in the nearby islands, and the middle third of the island was destroyed. So by the afternoon of January 15th, the eruptions were quiet and the island now looked like this. Its middle third was gone. So 20 hours of comparatively minor steam and rock Circe and eruptions left Hunga Tonga looking like this. These little islets are covered in tephra and ash and debris. The water is discolored both from sediments and volcanic uh, gases. So this is sulfur staining the water along with some other stuff. Uh, the center of the volcano, the caldera has collapsed further. And as this picture was taken from satellite, seawater is infiltrating the crater, uh, the magmatic conduit where the, all the hot rock lives. 5 p.m. 15th of January, two hours after this picture was taken, uh, some scientists on Twitter, whoops, shared this picture and reported loud booms and steam and ash plumes rising. Look at the size of this thing. This is all volcanic plume. At this moment, the volcano caldera had collapsed and a massive steam explosion with the power of 60 to 100 megatons of TNT, that's a million tons of TNT. And for comparison, the largest explosion ever created by humanity was a 50 megaton nuclear bomb detonated by the Russians back in the 60s. So this is easily, you know, nearly two times that size just with the steam explosion. This is what happens when the ocean meets an open volcanic conduit where magma meets ocean. And within eight minutes, 
this explosion plume rose 58 kilometers tall, which is the mesosphere. So it punched through the troposphere, which is where we live, the stratosphere where airliners fly, and it punched above that into the mesosphere. And once it hit that altitude, it ballooned out to 600 kilometers across. So I took the liberty of overlaying it on the Northwest here. And if Portland is the center of the explosion, uh, then the ash cloud reaches almost to Victoria, British Columbia, Crater Lake in the south, and Pendleton, Oregon. Um, so you could drive for three and a half hours in any direction and still be underneath cloud from <laughs> this volcanic plume. That's just astonishingly huge. The first tsunami waves reach uh, Kualofa, which is the capital city of Tonga, uh, 15 minutes after the explosion. Atmospheric shockwaves were circling the globe, which ended up going all the way around four individual times. Booms were heard in Anchorage and Fairbanks, Alaska, eight hours later. So that's 6,000 miles away, uh, this explosion was being heard. Uh, as it sounded like distant thunder, rumbling and booms, which is how it was described. And within 15 minutes after the eruption, 400,000 lightning bolts had been detected. 400,000 lightning bolts, uh, which are generated by static electricity, by volcanic material, ash and rock and debris, uh, rubbing together and interacting with the steam. There's a lot of moisture. It's a very static environment. So you get lots of lightning. And the tsunami is propagating across the Pacific. Within a couple of hours, the islands of Tongo, there are, I think, 20 individual islands, uh, all of which had been nearly completely inundated, up to 20 meters above sea level locally. This just, yeah, a lot of it was completely trashed. This is was a uh, large and popular resort on the beach. There's nothing left of it. Uh, this was a fishing community. There's just not much left of it. Uh, and to make matters worse, the communication cable, which runs across the seafloor, which connects all island nations in the world, uh, it was completely severed. So for four days, no one was able to get word into or out of Tonga except by satellite phone. So we really had no idea what was going on, where in the meantime, they were dealing with managing both effects from a volcanic eruption, which blanketed the islands in ash, which is why these images look so gray. They were dealing with a, excuse me, quite large tsunami impacting everything in the island. And there were no power, there was no services of any kind. Um, so they were alone in the world dealing with that, which is, you know, that's a big thing. Obviously it ended up being okay, more or less. So just back to the tsunami, waves up to four feet high impacted Port San Luis, which is in the central California coast and caused some damage there. I didn't put it on this slide, but when I was reading up again this morning, there were six foot waves in Santa Cruz, which caused some damage to docks and boats. There were six foot waves on Vancouver Island and uh, six foot waves or two meters in Peru. So when the plume had cleared several days later, the island was pretty much deleted from existence, we found. This is what it looked like before the 2014 eruptive period, after the 2014 eruptive period. And then in the two weeks before the eruption, and then what it looked like after the eruption. So these are all at the same scale. Uh, so the little islands that made up the visible top of the volcano were basically halved in size. Uh, the devastation is just, it's something, <laughs> it's really cool. All right, so the impacts of the explosion. Well, there's now a big hole on the top of the volcano, uh, but the edifice, the slopes of it are surprisingly intact. Uh, it's still volcano shaped. It's still got some of these flat tops, which you see in uh, ocean volcanoes. The caldera, which makes the center of the volcano was deepened to over 850 meters. So that's uh, about 2,600 feet. It used to be about a thousand feet deep. So it got, 
uh, more than doubled in depth and width and size, six and a half cubic kilometers of material was blasted out of the center of the volcano here. Six cubic kilometers of which was deposited on the slopes underwater of the volcano. Uh, and sonar surveys, which didn't really come out until a couple of months ago from now, uh, show the scale of the deposition of material. Uh, so blue on this map shows the loss of material and red shows a gain of material up and down 40 meters. Uh, so pretty much everything on the upper slopes of the volcano uh, sloughed away in these big turbidity currents underwater landslides that traveled as much as 50 kilometers away from the center of the volcano, which is enormous, that's huge. Those are uh, comparable in scale to some of the largest underwater landslides that have ever been directly observed. Um, but on top of these uh, six and a half cubic kilometers of material excavated, it was a total of eight cubic kilometers that got erupted from the volcano during that explosion. But only six kilometers of that was found on the slopes of the volcano. So the remaining roughly two cubic kilometers of material um, is now floating around in the mesosphere. It is in the air. Uh, everybody in the Southern Hemisphere is getting to enjoy a little bit of the Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha'apai volcano as it makes its way <laughs> around the globe. So why was it so big? A combination of a number of eruptions repeatedly weakening this uh, submarine volcano and the caldera floor. There was very shallow magma storage. If you remember that cross-section diagram uh, I showed a little while ago, a lot of the magma is stored really within a kilometer or two of the surface. Plus, once all of this uh, weakened submarine caldera collapsed, you have the volume of the Pacific Ocean rushing in to fill the void, which then created the largest steam explosion since 1883. So that's 239 years, I think, largest volcano observed. And it has been a cornucopia of beautiful academic research. Everybody from volcanologists and tsunami scientists and meteorologists, biologists, seismologists, and emergency managers are all learning valuable lessons from this volcano. Uh, just to tie in the meteorology and the climatology, the water and gas and uh, other material injected into the upper atmosphere um, had the effect of raising global temperatures by anywhere from two thousandths to two hundredths of a degree Celsius for a couple of years. Um, eventually that will settle out. Um, usually when people talk about volcanic eruptions, they think of uh, a volcanic winter, which happened from Tambora and Krakatoa, both in the 1800s. Uh, but this was such a water rich eruption because it was entirely centered underwater um, that the water vapor in the upper atmosphere is acting as a little bit of a greenhouse blanket uh, that's dis going to dissipate over the next few years. But the big takeaway, I think, was that we realized that because there are hundreds of other volcanoes just like this around the world's oceans, how many more Hunga Tonga eruptions could we see? How many more eruptions like this are likely in our lifetime? Maybe it's a lot, maybe it's not that many. Uh, obviously eruptions this size are very rare on a human time scale at least, but you know, we hadn't really thought of these submarine volcanoes as being main uh, sources of major eruptions before. So this is sort of changing how volcanic hazard people are thinking about submarine volcanoes, particularly in the South Pacific. Um, the ultimate toll, the human toll from this eruption was about $90 million in damage in uh, the nation of Tonga from the eruption and the tsunami. There were three fatalities in Tonga, plus two uh, from the tsunami in Peru, which is, uh, I think, five or 6,000 miles away. Uh, and there were about 40 people injured. So obviously it could have been a lot worse. Uh, I think Tonga came out of this bruised and battered, but they're gonna be okay. And the recovery effort is going on very well. 
the amount of research we're getting from this eruption is staggering and it will, I'm sure, continue to come out <laughs> over the next few years. So with that extremely deep dive into that one volcanic eruption, that 15 minutes of fame that Tonga got this year, uh, that's all I've got. And I'll see you in January for more geology news. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a number of questions. So if people want to raise their hands and with questions, um, I know I have a few. I saw Carrie, uh, Carrie you had some in the chat. Uh, maybe you could start us off. Well, well actually, I put, I put the comment in and then Andrew cheerfully answered it two seconds later. So, okay. <laughs> because one of the things that caught my attention is when he was talking about the fact that you had all of that material that landed on the lower slopes, the first thing that came to my mind is there's got to be some huge underwater landslides going on with that. Yep, Andrew answered that question. And then all that material that went into the atmosphere, I thought, oh, there's got to be a reflection in temperature. So Andrew, I was thinking colder. So yeah. what is causing the warmth? What's the warm up? Is it because of the moisture? It's the water vapor. In events like Tambora, which is a continental volcano, uh, that actually caused, I think it was two degrees Celsius in cooling, in combined with a number of other uh, solar and environmental factors. In 1815 and 16, we had the year without a summer. That eruption was basically the biggest in recorded history. Um, and this explosion, the initial explosion, probably was more powerful than that. Uh, obviously, uh, Hunga Tonga had about one-tenth as much eruptive volume, uh, but the energy released from that steam explosion was bigger than the Tambora eruption. But the amount of water vapor that shot up there is basically a nice warm fuzzy blanket over the southern hemisphere right now. Uh, in other continental volcanic eruptions, the cooling is caused by reflectance from the sulfur dioxides and uh, the particulate matter, which is reflective compared to the rest of the atmosphere. But I'm a geologist. Wow. I want to welcome Peregrine Aravada and Mari who came in. Um, and I see Michael has his hand up. Yes. Um, thank you for a very interesting discussion. I am um, a geology novice. I know practically nothing. It seems that um, practically all, or certainly most of the uh, geologic eruptions in modern history are in the Pacific area. I live in New York City. New York City, I was told was, well, the New York Islands were formed uh, mil millions of years ago by volcanic uh, eruption. Um, I see some head why, shaking. <laughs> why is that? Is that not true? Uh, well, I think that's nice. more than I do. Question okay, is, what's your question uh, first? What is, uh, you know, wh why are most of the mod almost exclusively the, uh, the geologic eruptions are in the Pacific Good area? Good question. And, there not, are... and, and what is the prognosis for my neck of the woods? <laughs> that's a really important question. Andrew? I would not lose sleep over volcanoes affecting the eastern seaboard. Uh -huh. Well, let, let me tell you something. I live, I, I live on top of the Ramapo Fault, which extends from Pennsylvania through New Jersey and into New York State. I was awakened by a volcanic eruption, I'd say about 25 years ago, where I live. So uh, there is some activity, but certainly not the kind that you mentioned. <laughs> This is where I have to burst your bubble in the most gentle and academic of ways. <laughs> There's a thing in statistics called the law of large numbers, where anything happening in the world, in a planet with 8 billion people on it, someone is waking up at the exact moment as something else. You happen to wake up at the exact moment as a volcanic eruption 25 years ago. Was and it on the eastern seaboard? What, where it was, was not it? on the eastern seaboard. Okay. Um, there are earthquakes that happen on the eastern seaboard. Right. It's possible that I don't know the earthquake history of the Northeast at all. Um, but that's you know that's something that could have woken you up. But back to why there are so many volcanoes in the South Pacific. There are so many uh, oceanic 
and continental tectonic plates crashing into each other down there. There are at least a half a dozen different major subduction zones where continents are diving down into the interior and melting. There are thousands and thousands of volcanoes uh, just concentrated really in the area between India and, uh, uh, I don't know, what else is <laughs> on the other side of the, uh, South America, I guess. <laughs> Um, there's, it's such a geologically complex area that that's where we get uh, the most frequent major earthquakes and the most frequent large volcanic eruptions. It's just a chaotic part of the globe. And it's also one of the most densely populated parts of the globe. So, well, is it, well, is it, the, is it that the, uh, there is more reporting in the Pacific area because it occurs uh, in in populated areas, whereas I, I saw from your map, there is a major fault in the Atlantic with several major faults, but yes, I guess they're um, not populated areas, except yes. for Iceland. <laughs> you're, you're right. Uh, those are, the volcanic eruptions that do happen there are uh, really gentle, and they happen under the water. They're basically gentle Hawaiian style eruptions like those pictures from Mauna Loa. Um, but they're happening 10,000 feet underwater. Um, so we don't really notice those. And they're so far away from anything that we don't really detect them. Uh, the, you know, a volcano that does do damage, that has major world affecting uh, impacts, uh, almost always has some kind of surface expression, or at least it gets very close to the surface of the water. And there are only a couple of those in the Atlantic Ocean as a whole entity outside of Iceland, uh, but there are thousands of them in the South Pacific. Well, I'm going to hand it to our panelist and uh, GSOC member, retired Forest Service geologist, Kerry Gordon. <laughs> I don't know if I can follow that one. Andrew's pretty amazing. <laughs> so, what I'm talking about today is an adventure in circles and connections, not so much geology as just experiencing how things come about. And I went on an awesome field trip last fall to Quartzville, and that was led by Clark. And it's been something that's been on my bucket list for literally decades. So I'm gonna do a quick little screen share here to show you why this circle was just so amazing. In the 1980s, I moved to uh, Philomath, Prineville to work in the Coast Range. And I was going, okay, Oregon, I've never lived in Oregon. I gotta start exploring. So I got out this cool book and it said, you can find pyrite crystals in road cuts up on the Green Peter Reservoir. So I took myself from Philomath out on this little adventure and I drove up past, past Sweet Home and wandered up these back roads to a road cut that I thought was literally right near Sweet Home. It wasn't, but I had a very poor memory, turns out. Fast forward, 1990s to 2017, I was working here in Prineville for the Forest Service, and my coworkers, Ruth Seeger and Rob Ginn, kept talking about all of these miners that they were interacting with from an administration standpoint up here out of Sweet Home. And I thought, well, what are they looking at? What's the geology? All I could remember was this pyrite crystals. Well, fast forward to 2022, my good friend, June McAtee said, hey, I need a second. You wanna go on this field trip to Courtsville? We're going, oh, are we gonna be able to get in? It's already full. Clark says, yeah, we'll get you in. So I got to go with June on this field trip. One of the things that I really enjoy is driving the roller coaster right here on Highway 20 between the top of, uh, uh, Sandy Ann Pass and Sweet Home going over Tollgate because I like landslides. But the highway was closed because they were fixing the active landslides again. So 
June and I took this little road trip by way of Highway, Highway 22 through Detroit. For those of you that have never had the opportunity to drive back roads and look at the geology, this country on the, the west slope of the Cascades is just gorgeous. Big, huge valleys, lots of really cool geology coming around the corner. Because we couldn't just take the main, the main back roads. We had to take the county roads. That's the way you really see geology. So field trip. What we ended up doing is Clark took us up into the back country along Green Peter Reservoir, looking at all of these really amazing rocks. My memorable take home is seeing a cinder cone on the west side. And it was about covered in vegetation as you would expect for a west side cinder cone. And it was, yep, you can see the scoria, there it is. But it didn't look like any cinder cone that I have here around the, the east side of the Cascades. So that was a fun way to see something really weathered and about the same age as our, our cinder cones here, but it was just woof, all but melted away, which I'm why I'm looking forward to learning about those one-time events this, this next winter with the, with the geology talks. We didn't get to the road cut with the pyrite crystals. Clark, the road was closed to get up there. And Clark assures me that those pyrite crystals still reside in that ditch along the road cut up way up above Green Peter Reservoir. I could have sworn I only drove a couple miles, but apparently I explored a lot further. Who knew? So when I started looking at Quartzville, I realized that it was all of these circles connecting with friends and books and figuring out that, that I finally got an opportunity to field trip with Clark, not in the Ochico Mountains, but over on the west side. And I finally got to see all that mining country that Ruth and Rob Ginn kept telling me about for decades, literally. And I found out that where those pyrite crystals are is a lot further up the road than I thought. So Clark, thank you for a fun field trip. And I'm looking forward to more with you. So Most thank pleasure. you all. And I guarantee there's still pyrite up there. Well, okay. So I know this is the thing about the pyrite in here is really, 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 really tiny. And it's not the big, pretty crystals that I found. So Clark did find his pyrite. He did. He did but but she's talking about the crystals that you can find on Boulder Creek. It's a well-known rock hounding locality. And you can get uh, pyrite crystals up to the size of your fingernails, your, your big ones, thumbnails about they're rare, but the little size about your little fingernail. And people uh, hunt there. And I can tell you, I can show you pictures of it in 1968 where they had a, a bank, but it has been mined pretty hard in there. And it's got a big, big, uh, big depression in there now. So over the, the decades. Well, thank you, Carrie. And we're going to hear again from you about in uh, at our next geology talk in January. And what are you going to talk about then? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, don't you just give the title. So the, the title subhead. is Landslides in the Ochico Mountains. And okay. I will drill down into one small one. All right. So we'll be back on the east side of the Cascades. All right. Well, Clark, we've got 11 minutes left of our recorded show, and then we're going to turn off the recording and ask people if they have any uh, geologically related resolutions they want to, or natural world resolutions they want to share with us. Do you have enough time, Clark, to... Uh, yeah, I'll uh, go through it quick. Uh, go you're going to be the guinea pigs for a talk I'm going to give. All right. And if you run a couple minutes over, that's all right, because this so, is the, uh, we we're happy to be your guinea pigs. Talked about Lakeview, and if you're not familiar with Lakeview, <clears throat> excuse me, that's in Lake County in uh, uh, the very southern part of central Oregon, down near the border with Nevada. And uh, 
it was a yellow, it was a stop on the yellow cake road. And what I mean by that, yellow cake is an industrial term for, for U308. Uh, and it uh, is a uh, uranium oxide. So Oregon played a role in the atomic age in the 1950s and 60s uh, after the, uh, during the Cold War. And in the 1950s and 60s, if you were a popular mechanics fan or something like that, you would pick up and see all about the Geiger counters and they even made some movies about uranium back then. But prospectors searched Oregon and, uh, uh, and the Western uh, 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 United States for, for uh, uranium. They just take a Geiger counter out there and go look. In fact, uh, these two guys out of Salem formed a country, Dectro uh, Dectronics, and uh, get, uh, got themselves a, a surplus uh, army vehicle, put a drill rig on their front, carried a Geiger counter out there, and started looking for, for uh, uh, discoveries and, and ultimately mines. And so here's what Oregon has. Blue dots are, uh, are uh, uranium occurrences. Of all those, uh, six kind of stood out. Uh, three of them uh, were actively explored, Bear Creek, Butte, and the White King and Lucky Lass. And two of them, Lucky Lass and the White King, became, ultimately became mines. Well, how this all happened? Uncle Sam made it happen, and they started the yellow cake boom in the 1950s. In fact, in 1954 is when it started. But the Atomic Energy Commission, who uh, who headed all this up was actually uh, was formed in 1948, but uh, the uh, uh, A AEC is for its acronym provided stimulus incentives. In fact, they paid for it. Was a red a red a customer for anybody who wanted to go in and mines, and so industry, let's make it frank here, took had little risk, and the government assumed it all. But uh, it was. Ex extremely successful. And in fact, after three years after it started, they ate the, the Atomic Energy Commission started to limit purchases. Um, program ended in, in 1970. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, they were the only buyers for a while. It was a monopoly, a government monopoly. And then you can see here through the 1964 Act of Private Ownership that they kind of gave that up. Uh, and then you can see the history of it, and, and quite frankly, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission is now, you know, it chases its, its lineage to the uh, Department of Energy, which was established in 1977. So uh, what, what did the AEC do? Well, they contracted with private individuals and firms, and they, uh, they paid for uranium plants, processing plants, paid for mining operations, subsidized them too. And you can see this, this map here, it's the chlorophyll map, if you're into the GIS vernacular. It shows in the blue that Oregon, and with uh, three other states, only had one mill, while uh, uh, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and New Mexico all had numerous uh, 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 processing plants. And of course, Colorado was the epicenter with its plants and now its, its legacy of those of the of the processing plants. Let's go to to uh, to Lakeview and show you where it is. So this is a map. This is Lake County off on the left. The uh, aerial uh, is an oblique view, and it shows Lakeview, which is 2,400, but has a population of 2,200, uh, 2,400 people. It's about 4,800 feet above sea level, and it is in a typical based in the range valley. And you can see here that the, the mill was up here at the northern part of town, about, about a mile from downtown. And I think you can see geographically the, the, the range falls. Uh, and this is the flatlining valley. Okay, so in 1957, the AEC contracted with the, uh, with, uh, the Lakeview Mining Company. And I loaned them $2.6 million to build this plant. It was built in a year. The plants, uh, you can see various uh, uh, views of the plant after during construction and after construction. At, uh, and you can see also its statistics. It only lasted two years before it closed. And then uh, went through many ownerships after 1960. And, and there was about five of them with Atlantic Richfield Arco, the oil company. 
back in the day there in the 60s was also into the mineral world. They purchased the plant. Now, Arco uh, uh, also was kind of back then uh, as an environmental consciousness and the consequences of this, this uh, uh, activity, they took it upon themselves to start to uh, clean up some, to do some decontamination work at the, at the mill site. You can see a map here of the, of the parcel here with the different features of the, the, uh, the processing plant. You have the mill off to the right here along uh, Highway 397 and the tailings and these uh, evaporation ponds or raffinate ponds. And you can see their acreage there. Overall, there was close to a million cubic yards of RRMs, which is a residual radioactive material that was finally uh, gathered from the site. And I'll talk about that in a little while. So uh, there was two cleanups, one in 68, another one in, in 1976. And all of that material was put in this tailings pile area through here. The ponds were not touched. They, they, were, uh, they were left. And in 1977, that's when um, our DEQ, I think Dagami was involved in this too, and that's the Department of, of, of Geology and Mineral Industries where I retired from, but a different part of us, uh, cleared the site and it was purchased by uh, the Precious and Pine Lumber for a lumber mill and the specific pine products now. And just kind of keep that in mind. I'll mention here in a little while too, again. So it sat there for quite a while. And that then all the, the uh, uh, Department of Energy and their mandate for cleanup and, and decontamination of these sites went and uh, uh, built a disposal site about five miles to the northwest, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner. They, uh, this work began in 1986, and it lasted through 89, and it, it, uh, it, it kind of... Uh, uh, took a took 40 acres for this disposal site. And then also uh, DOE, Department of Energy, in the 19, mid-19s also started the groundwater. So here we have a disposal site uh, 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 with its legacy now of capped radioactive materials. It's also, it presents now an issue with groundwater, surface water as well, but here and at the mill site, that are now being constantly monitored and will be for, for its life and our lifetimes too. Now going back to the mill site and kind of the present day, this mill site has, after its cleanup, has also saw a re, uh, kind of a rebirth or a brownfield regeneration, if you will, and it's now being used again. Uh, the Pacific Pine product uh, occupies the former mill site and its mill buildings, which were decontaminated. Later on, uh, if you've heard of perlite and use it in your garden, this is where Oregon's perlite is, is uh, processed and then shipped in rail down to California. But this is the Emery's perlite or cornerstones as it used to be known. And what better way to kind of use a, a area that had uh, evaporation ponds and what you would think would be just uh, would, would be undesirable for uh, any kind of other uses to put a solar farm on it. And uh, that's what they're doing right now uh, using it. So the outline of the, the facility or the property is in yellow, of course. So let's uh, kind of turn focus our attention now onto the geology. And this is a map uh, Dagami made. It uh, just is here to kind of as a placemat to show you that this, all this geology here, which is mostly Cenozoic, is a result of Yellowstone hot pot spot activity. And, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on here, but it's all basalts, day sites to, uh, to sandstone and siltstones. And you can see it's heavily pot, uh, faulted. And these valleys here are, remin are characteristics of this valley, uh, basin and range type geology. Now, if we kind of look a little, Closer at the geology here, we have the Lakeview Uranium District, which corresponds to this inset square right here. And this is the geology. So it's it's mostly blue, it's basalts, which are blue. Uh, the reds are rhyolite domes and other other features of rhyolite. And this other, and then the rest of this area is is, uh, is uh, pyroclastics, 
volcanic clastic sediments, which are derived from volcanic uh, rocks, and uh, and ignimbrite, which is a is a is a prior clastic flow. These are uh, I, I, sh I should say that these are related to what I consider as a a bimodal type activity. And I will mention at the very end that uh, off to the west here is the uh, Bonanza is the what's called the Bonanza or uh, the Quartz Mountain Gold Deposit. And it's one of those sitting here in Oregon with the right economic uh, uh, conditions could become a, a gold mine and, uh, and then it would be an open pit. So I just wanted to point out here's the Lucky Lass here and the White King. And the distance between the two is about a mile. So go, focusing our attention here onto the White King and uh, mine, which was the prominent producer here. And I should say it's a, it has a distinction here as being the largest producer of uranium from a, a, a volcanic rock source in the United States. So yay for Oregon on that one. Off to the left here is a, um, a map that uh, shows the workings here. And it's, it looks like a bunch of spaghetti lines, but those are all tunnels. The mine was first developed underground and it uh, had three levels, uh, about 1,000, 4,000 foot of workings. And it was, uh, uh, production was from two shafts. And I will point out that that shaft in the distance here where my pointer is located is one of just a handful of actual head frames that were, that we can find in Oregon, or I can, I can tell. Right now, what you're looking at is a photograph of them just starting to, abandon the underground workings and starting to develop an open pit. And this is in 1949. Uh, and you can read here that uh, there was two periods of, of activity for operation of the two mines. And I won't go through that. And I want to point out that there was uh, what's left in the ground and what uh, uh, is substantial. So if there was a, a uh, uh, the price is right or <laughs> and doubtful if there's any any way they could do it within my lifetime, there is a significant amount of, uh, of reserves still left in the ground here. Right now, uh, we, we if you want to go out there and look at these mines, they've all been reclaimed. And uh, that means that the uh, uh, material, radioactive material that is at least found on the ground will have been put into individual storage cells for perpetuity and uh, groundwater is being monitored there. So this is a legacy of, of mining here and, uh, and will be for our lifetimes, our children's lifetimes. So uh, again, these are just views of it. You can see the geology in the pits uh, with dipping sediments and you can even look at the rhyolites, which are the, the principal hosts here. So this all started in the mid 1990s and lasted for a decade. So let's uh, kind of, let me leave you with this. Is there another stop on the Yellow Cake Road in Oregon? And I'm going to say that it is. It's possible. And it's down here in Malheur County, where my pointer is located, is the uh, southeast corner of Malheur County. This map here shows you a lot of different things. It shows you uh, in red dots the, the mineral resources, which are mostly gold. The calderas are outlined in black. And I have a pointer right here that goes to the Grassy Mountain project, which could be a gold mine in the next five to 10 years, provided permitting goes through and funding is, is available. That said, what we're going to talk about is the, uh, the Aurora Energy Metals Project's uranium and lithium focus here. So we're, out, we're talking about this right up here. Uh, I will point out right over here that this is Jindalee's resources. This is all lithium right here. Uh, but what Aurora Energy Metals has is that they have a, uh, I have a cross section through it that shows that it has uranium mineralization at the contact uh, with the volcanic se sediments. And it has a couple of hot spots and it has about 18 million pounds of, of yellow cake or iron oxide. Remember that's the industrial term or the finished product that, uh, that's out there. And that is an elephant size deposit similar to what they have in Colorado, New Mexico, and so forth out there. So this is not a not a just a inconsequential resource out here. 
It is a uh, also capped or there are sediments and these are moat sediments that filled the caldera right through here that are lithium rich and have a mineral called hectorite. It's a clay mineral. And so I'm going to leave you with one question here. We have two different of, of non-fossil fuel energy sources here. Are we willing to exploit any or one or any of those, lithium in particular? That's the question I, I give, I'm going to ask, and uh, uh, it's a rhetorical question, but each of us have got to decide whether it's going to be, whether we're going to have to mine our way into greener energy. That said, I'll, I'm going to conclude this by saying, that, and this is what you see as you go into town in Lakeview is the Lakeview Cowboy. Tallest town in Oregon means it's, it's at 4,800 elevation. But uh, Lakeview was a home to a, just kind of a small scale mi a mining operation compared to its counterparts. And by that, I mean to the other states, particularly the, the four that uh, were the, the, great, the biggest producer. Um, it uh, also reflects the one, the time that the energy, Atomic Energy Committee had a dominance of the uranium industry and Oregon was a player, just a little one. I, I'm not going to, I don't want to trivialize this, but there are environmental and health consequences related to, to this mill site. It was, uh, there's a couple documentaries about that, in fact, at least one. And there are still constantly, there's a long-term stewardship that we, that's going to be a result of of that site and the, the mining sites and now are part of, of Lakeview's legacy. But one thing Lakeview was not, it was not a company town and nor an instant uranium boom town. So it didn't live or die on whether or not uh, there was a market for uranium and uh, like many, many other towns throughout the West. And it is, uh, uh, and so the well-being of this community was not related to the uranium development. And today, if I wouldn't have told you, I, it'd be interesting to find out of how many of you even knew or had heard that there was a uranium mill at-, uh, at Didn't Lake know Lewis until you told me last legacy. night, Clark. Huh? <laughs> I didn't until know last until, night. You, until you so, told me at about 8 p.m. last night. <laughs> so, I'll, so I'll leave it at that and thank okay. you. Uh, I, I, uh, for, for listening to me and, and yeah. let me have, share a little bit of time with you. So that is a fascinating I presentation. I think we're going to have questions. We are at our hour, so we're going to, uh, I'm so going to have 11, Gary stop. Minutes, I'll, make, I'll make my, my conference limit. I get 15 minutes. You did great. Um, I'm going to have Gary stop the recording in just a second. Not yet, Gary, because I want to leave. We're, we're going to keep the room open for another half hour and People can ask questions and, and I, I want to hear people's resolutions. But I want to thank uh, Andrew, especially for your all your contributions in the past year. Um, it's been wonderful to rely on you and to have your enthusiasm about earthquakes and volcanoes infect the rest of us and, and deepen our knowledge there. Carrie, Gordon, you're a star. Really have appreciated your energy on the panel. Um, Emma Rahalski couldn't be with us today, but um, she's also been a wonderful addition. And, and thank you, Clark, for, for being a regular, Patty and uh, Scott Burns. Um, and uh, especially, oh, I want to shout out to my wife, Peregrine. Peregrine, say hi. <laughs> uh, who I probably would not be, I, I know I would not be doing this, uh, this, this interesting work were it not for her uh, it, sort of opening the doors for me for in, in terms of uh, thinking about the environment, thinking about the natural world. And finally, uh, Gary Joe Quinn, our technical director is kind of in behind the scenes here, has made this process of the, the geology talk, our monthly, our monthly meetup, so much uh, easier for me and uh, created the, the sort of base on which we can kind of expand and um, you know, in, in improve the quality of our presentations, include the quality of what we're putting on YouTube and just have the great conversations that we're having. So I'm gonna sort of do have him do a countdown of five, four, three, two, one, so that he can turn off the recording and then we'll continue the discussion. 